Okay, so welcome, welcome everybody to our weekly seminars in the group of quantum information and quantum computation here in Warsaw. Today we have uh, Sophie Egelhoff from the University of Geneva. Uh, Sophie is doing her PhD together with uh, Rope Wola and also Nicola Brunner. And today, uh, Sophie is going to talk about certification of entanglement using quantum steering in networks. Uh, Sophie, thank you very much for your uh, for accepting our invitation, and this screen is yours. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you everyone for coming and listening to my talk. So first, I want to kind of motivate why we even want to certify entanglement in the first place. And while I'm sure everyone has heard of entanglement certification and knows that it's a valuable quantum resource that we can use to gain some advantage over classical protocols in communication tasks and cryptography tasks and various different areas of quantum information or also quantum computing and other related fields. And so before implementing these protocols, it may be useful to actually certify that we do have entanglement if we want to later exploit it in our protocol. So this is kind of the idea. Now, for certification, we usually have uh, three regimes that we can divide these into, which would be uh, fully device dependent, in which case we say that all of the measurements are fully trusted. We have access to the description of our measurement operator. And so we can gain full access to the quantum description if we wish to through things like state tomography. However, this requires a high level of control of our quantum um, measurements. And so this is not always feasible in an experimental setup. This is why there are also other regimes such as the device independent regime where we say, well, we just have black boxes as measurements and we just know what we give it as an input and what we gain as an output, both classical. And so in this case, we have access to the probability distribution that we gain from this and not the full quantum description which in turn means that there's some states that we may not be able to certify and we kind of need more resources to actually certify entanglement in these regimes, which is why people have also started looking at what is called the semi-device independent regime, where we kind of have a mixture between these two. And in this talk, I'll be focusing on quantum steering, which is quite literally a mix of both of these regimes. Now, there's also been this development of looking at the device deep uh, independent case and bringing this to networks, meaning that we add the assumption of independent sources and then say, well, if we have independent sources, can we still send something about this collective state then? And well, in this case, we don't actually need inputs to our measurements because normally we need multiple measurements on each of the systems to actually say anything of meaning. Um, but now if we actually link these different independent sources with each other, we can drop the inputs and only require one measurement. Furthermore, this kind of gives us a new correlation structure that we can investigate. And people have also exploited it to show things like that we don't actually need, uh, that we do require complex numbers to describe quantum uh, mechanics and can't just go to the kind of proposed uh, real number theories. And so in this um, project, we're kind of looking at what happens if we take a semi-device independent protocol and bring it to a network, meaning that here we add the assumption of independent sources to a semi-device independent regime. So if I may remind you of the title, we wanted to certify entanglement using quantum steering in networks. So I'll just quickly um, go over quantum steering so that we're definitely all aware where what this is and to introduce how I'll be denoting different things throughout the talk as I think this will make things clearer later on and then also talk about which networks exactly we're investigating. So in quantum steering we have two parties Alice and Bob and throughout this talk I'll be denoting like the individual qubits that they hold with these kind of dots and then a wavy line to indicate that they have some shared state uh, and so if there's no wavy line then the qubits will have no quantum correlations. And well, it, because it's a semi-device independent protocol, we actually treat one half, namely Bob, as if it was fully device independent, meaning that he ha just has some black box um, with some input that we give to it. So it's kind of the measurement choice. 
and some output. Now, throughout this talk, I'll only be talking about measurements with a discrete outcome and not with continuous outcomes as this then um, uh, um, adds another layer when it comes to the possibilities of how to implement these things and is a whole nother project by itself. But because we restrict ourselves to discrete outcomes, we can also assume that we are operating in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, uh, or at least a countable one. And as well, we will be assuming that there is some quantum description. So it's not about um, certifying entanglement compared to something beyond quantum, but it's uh, comparing quantum to what we call the classical regime. And on the other hand, we have Alice, which is fully trusted. So we can access her measurement device in the sense that we have a full description of it. We can write down the operation. And so she can gain information about the state she holds. So her post measurement state, the like, part of uh, her qubit, I will denote with sigma and then indexed with uh, B and uh, Y. Sorry, Sophie. Yes. Uh, are you changing slides because it is not... Ah, is it not showing? For me, it's only one, yeah. It's You're not still changing. The... Okay, wait, let me... Yeah, on the title screen. Fix this. Yes. Um. Wait, let me see. By now, has it changed at all by now? Uh, now, now it's... Uh, try changing now. Moving from one to the other. Is it still on? Uh, no, uh, now it's on quantum steering on the, like Alice and Bob, but I don't know if you can change it. So... Okay, is it changing now? No. Okay. Um, I guess then maybe the easiest thing is if I make this larger. Does this Or work? maybe you can try sharing your screen with, uh, because there are two options you can choose. Maybe if you share the whole Desktop. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, one sec. Sorry about this. I hadn't realized. So, okay. We have quantum steering and I hope you can now see the slide. Yes. Um, great. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so we have quantum steering, we have Alice and Bob, and then Bob is untrusted. So here we have the input and the output, and then Alice, we have a full quantum description. So then we can, in this regime, we can certify entanglement by, for example, looking at the local hidden state model. So this model tells us, wait, so if we now look at the local hidden state model, then we can think of this as maybe Bob is cheating and it's not actually an entangled state, but we'd rather have just, um, yeah, some state that is sent from Bob to Alice according to some strategy. So in this, kind of cheating scenario, you could think of Bob has some strategy depending on the input Y given to him. He gives you some output B with a certain probability. So that's denoted here with this probability distribution. And then um, he sends some state to Alice depending on the strategy. And then, okay, we have a convex combination over the different options in his strategy since we don't have access to this. And so in this way, you can use steering to certify entanglement. And we kind of want to bring this idea to networks. So just to clarify what networks I'll be talking about throughout this talk is, um, so I'll be restricting myself to line networks and circular networks. The reason being that we only want bipartite sources, which later when I talk about the quantifiers, I think will be clear why we want only bipartite sources. And also we only want to operate on two qubits at a time. And this restricts us, restricts us naturally to a line or a circle. Um, and in this talk, I'll only be referring to the line because you can think of the circle as a line where the two endpoints are joined to be one party. So it's very straightforward to extrapolate the findings from a line to a circular network. And so just for clarity, I'll just be sticking to the line for this talk. Now, if we look at the easiest line, this kind of bilocality scenario, we would have two states. And as I said before, these would be independent. So row one and row two are independent, meaning that also Alice and Charlie do not share any quantum correlations at the beginning of our protocol. And then in the spirit of um, quantum steering, we will distribute different parties to be trusted and others to be untrusted. So specifically, we'll be saying that Bob is untrusted, so he performs some measurement and gives us some output. As I said before, 
we don't need an input to this measurement because we have two sources now and this is sufficient for a protocol and also we'll be restricting ourselves to discrete outcomes throughout this talk um, and so we can say that well Bob has some quantum description on some countable basis we'll be exploiting this part later on um, when looking at the results on the other hand, Alice and Charlie are fully trusted, meaning that they can gain access to their quantum description if they wish to, um, through performing, for example, state tomography. Now, an example would be, let's say Alice and Bob share some separable state, but Bob and Charlie could share some entangled state. Well, if Alice and Bob don't share any quantum correlations at the beginning of our protocol, it is natural to see that um, Alice and Charlie will not share any quantum correlations at the end of our protocol, since if Bob performs some measurement, there's no reason that now Alice should suddenly have some quantum entanglement with the other two. And so by simply um, this kind of intuition, but you can also write it down mathematically by simply writing uh, sigma as a partial trace, and then writing all of the operators out, you can actually see that you get a separable state again. And so we can see, well, if it's if one of the states is separable, then we will only get something separable in the end, which implies that if we get something entangled at the end, we can actually be sure that both of the states were entangled before. And if we go to longer lines by induction, this holds for all of the states. So I hope this set up or this kind of regime that we're operating is now clear so i'd like to present what we kind of found because we want to go beyond just saying whether it's entangled and also speak about how much entanglement we have and well for how much we kind of need a quantifier since the different quantifiers i'll be touching on two today in this talk one is the best separable approximation and one is the schmidt number so these are um, both quantifiers for entanglement but they look at slightly different um, aspects of entanglement in the sense that the best separable approximation kind of looks at how far away are we from the separable set, whilst the Schmidt number also looks at the dimensionality of our entangled state. And then I want to, uh, towards the end, show that we can actually use this as well for the activation of high dimensional one-way steerable states, or like a specific example of it, um, but I'll explain this in more detail later on. So starting with the best separable approximation, um, it's, as I said, kind of looking at how far are we from the separable state. Um, so we take our state, say rho, and we subtract some amount of some other state, and then we end up in the separable set. This is the definition of our best separable approximation. And then we want to find the t for which this is minimal. So we want to know how much do we actually need to subtract from our original state in order to end up in something separable. And we can reformulate this into a state decomposition and say that, well, our state can always be decomposed in some state and some separable state. And just a mixture of these two, and we kind of want to see how much separable state can we actually have in this decomposition. And so now we bringing this to the network, we want to see can we use the best separable approximation of our post measurement state to lower bound the best separable approximation of the individual states in the network? So we can write um, a best separable approximation for each of the states in our network. So here's the simplest case where we just have two states. Again, these are independent and they have some uh, best separable approximation. So here I've just used the I to kind of um, indicate which one it would be. So row, uh, row one would then have T1, eta one plus uh, one minus T1, um, new one. And then for two, we would have the same thing. And the T1 and T2 are unrelated. They're just the best separable approximation for each of these states. And now thinking back to the example we spoke about before, where we looked at the, if one of the states is separable, the final state is separable we can see that this decomposition can be thought of as a mixture, but it could also be thought of as, you know, the probability of performing yeah. this state eta is actually T and the probability of performing uh, state nu is 
one minus t. So one minus t times we actually prepare a separable state. So now if uh, source one and or source two prepare a separable state, we're in the separable regime for the final post measurement state. The only time we can get something entangled in the final state is if both of them prefer, uh, perform or produce some eta one and eta two. And so looking at the best separable approximation of our final state, we can actually see by simply plugging in and then seeing this convex combination, uh, we can see that the best separable approximation of our post measurement state is simply upper bound by the product of the best separable approximations of our state one and our state two. This in turn means that we can use the best separable approximation of our post measurement state to lower bound the product of the two best separable approximations. And given that the best separable approximation is always between zero and one, we can also say that this gives us a lower bound on in the individual best separable approximation. If these are not one, then this bound is obviously not tight, but if they are, then this would be a tight bound. And so in this sense, we can lower bound all of the best separable approximations in our network. If we wanted to, we could also add additional assumptions about the states to improve this bound. So for example, if we think that both of the best separable approximations are equal, then we could use the bound that we get and take the square root and say this is probably round about where our actual best separable approximation lies. And so this is kind of how we can use our final state to lower bound properties of the individual states. Now, I promise that you can do this with any number of parties. And so you can simply by induction do the same thing for as many parties as you want. So here the sigma is now indexed by, I hope it's showing up on the screen, a bold B to indicate that it's like B1, B2, B3, and so on and so forth. So it would be all of our outputs from each of the different bobs that are all untrusted. So we still only trust Alice and Charlie. And then we can see that well in order for the final state to be entangled, all of the states in the middle have to produce something entangled. And therefore, the best separable approximation of our final state is upper bound by the product of each of the best separable approximations. And this, of course, rephrased in the other direction means that we can use the best separable approximation of our final state to lower bound the product of all of the best separable approximations which then can be used to lower bound the best separable approximation of each of the states. But this is obviously the more states we add, if they're not perfect states, the worse our bound gets. So here it's a trade-off between, maybe I only want to perform a minimal number of measurements or a minimal number of state tomography, and hence I want to do as many states as possible in one go. And how much noise do I add by stringing these different states together? Um, and hence lowering the number that we can actually certify. So this is kind of one way of using this kind of setup to um, yeah, certify the best separable approximation in this case, and so some form of entanglement quantifier in this regime. Uh, if there are no questions, I'd like to move on to the Schmidt number so now. Actually, Sophie, actually, I would, mm -hmm. have, a, I would have a question. So... Yes. So here the sigma v is a state that is span between Alice and Charlie? Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, and exactly. Now, so you have many such states? Yes. So you have many such states that correspond to different outcomes of like all bobs. Mm -hmm. And so here yes. with this inequality, you can take the, the best E. Exactly. E. Yes. Yes. Yes, okay. exactly. So if you implement this, okay. you can either choose to do state tomography in all of them. So all the sigma Bs mm -hmm. for each of them, and then take the best bound, as you said, or you could say that you only do state tomography if you get a certain outcome, um, and then your bound might not be as good. This could be when you're implementing it, a trade-off um, that you can think of, but yeah, yes, this works for each state individually in our assemblage. The important thing is just to, that we know which state corresponds to which outcomes. Um, so you can't just sum over all of them because then we would end up with a mixed state. But yes, otherwise this is true. I also have a question. Any... Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so you said that you can easily go from the line network to the like circular network or whatever you call it. 
Uh, yes. In the circular one, do you trust only one party or do you have like two parties? So in that case, I would trust one party. So in okay. this case, you would think of Alice and Charlie being one Alice. So can you do a line where you trust only one party? Where you put um, trust that in the middle? So the problem is if it's trusted in the middle, you could also think of it as like two separate kind of steering Oh, yeah, things. yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. And so then the problem becomes that the outer parties more so become an input to the like further inner parties. And it's really just a steering thing between the neighboring ones to your trusted ones with some yeah, yeah, Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Makes um, sense. Yeah. Then okay, you can... Yeah, so this is why we would always trust the endpoints in a line, but in a circle, because of its symmetry, you could trust any party you want. Any other questions? Well, maybe I would have a follow-up question to what uh, uh, Avidush asked. So like in the, in the ring, if you have mm -hmm. just one party which is trusted, then uh, then in principle, you don't have a, a, an entangled state no, at the, at the, for, the, for this trusted yeah. party, and you cannot use this uh, best of power approximation for it. Um, so we're assuming that if it's one party, they mm -hmm. don't share any quantum correlations at the start. So this is the important thing, is that the sources are independent, and hence mm -hmm. the two qubits that you like can do a trusted operation on would not be share anything of meaning at the start. But then you can actually look at this entanglement between the two okay. at the end of your protocol. And this would, okay. well, mm -hmm. you can write the state in this way and then you can mm -hmm. also do this. Any other question? Okay, then I'll move on to the Schmidt number if that's all right. So as I said, the Schmidt number is also quantified for entanglement, but slightly different. So just as a reminder, what Schmidt number is. We have the Schmidt decomposition where we can write any pure bipartite state in this manner. And then the Schmidt rank would be the number of terms we need to write this um, decomposition. Now, this only applies to pure states and we don't want to certify under the assumption that we have pure states. So we need a generalization to uh, mixed states. And we chose the Schmidt number. There's also other generalizations that you could use in this case. And so what we look at is, well, a mixed state is a mixture of pure states. And so in this decomposition into pure states, we simply look at the Schmidt rank of each of these pure states. And so the rank kind of tells us how many levels do we need to get this form of entanglement. It's not the physical dimensions, but it's the levels you need for this particular state. And so we would look at how much do we need for each one of these pure states in our decomposition and then choose the highest number. The idea being that, well, if the number is lower, then I can always implement it using more levels. But if I have more levels than I, or if I need more levels than I have, then I wouldn't be able to implement it. So this is why we choose the highest number. So we can write it in this fashion. And then we simply minimize over all possible decompositions because the decomposition of a mixed state into pure states is not unique. An example would be that if we have a um, maximum entangled state with some noise, then we can add enough noise that even though the entangled part is not zero, we would still end up with a separable state overall. And so this is kind of what we want to mitigate with this minimization to not get some arbitrarily high Schmidt rank for even separable states. And so now the idea is that we can actually look at the Schmidt number of our final state to lower bound the Schmidt number of our states in the network. And this is actually surprisingly straightforward in the sense of if you just write out your state in the Schmidt decomposition, well, the mixture of Schmidt decompositions, you can just see that, well, the intuition is if I don't need this many levels to start with, I could in theory implement it in a system that only has these many physical dimensions. So let's say Alice and Bob and Bob and Charlie share some cutric cutret um, entanglement. Then there's no reason why Alice and Charlie should end up with Q quart or higher uh, cutits at the end of our protocol, because whatever Bob does on his kind of system we can never add any levels on Alice's and Charlie's side. And so in this sense, the Schmidt number of the states uh, that we have in the original thing tells us the maximum Schmidt number that we can get at the end. Um, and so 
we can again reverse this phrasing and say that the Schmidt number that we get at the end that is like of the state shared between Alice and Charlie gives us a lower bound on both of these states. So the bound is different to before in the sense that we have individual bounds. So before it was a bound on the product that we could turn into a bound on the individual ones. Here it's directly a bound on the individual ones. It's the same bound, but it's still individually. It's not on the product or sum or anything of these sorts of things. Well, if we just think of doing this line sequentially, but more often, then we can actually see that no matter the length of the network, it would always give us a lower bound on the Schmidt number of, the, of all of these states. Because whilst it's different experimentally and very important to distinguish these two cases, mathematically it would be the same as doing Bob one first, and then Bob two, and then Bob three, and so on and so forth. And so you can just think of these sequential things and you would always get a upper bound by the minimum that is already in your set. And so you continue and hence the Schmidt number of our final state gives us a lower bound on all of the Schmidt numbers in our network. Now, as I said before, this, um, kind of is nice in the sense that we have an individual bound in each of them and not some product, some whatever. However, of course, if we introduce more and more noise to our system, then we can not always certify the same Schmidt number. So just to illustrate this, if we look at the noisy maximally entangled state, so here psi plus D would indicate a maximum uh, entangled state on D dimensions. So it would be 0, 0, plus 1, 1, plus 2, 2, however high you want to go to D minus 1, and then, well, we normalize, and we have times this by P. And then 1 minus P, we add some white noise, so just the identity on the two. Well, if this is, say, at the state share between Alice and Bob, but the state share between Bob and Charlie is just psi plus D, then we can actually certify Schmidt number N um, if they satisfy this bound, which is the same bound as we would get in a um, fully device dependent case. However, if we have two such states, even if they have the sh same Schmidt number and the same P, um, now the bound applies to the product of these two. So now P1 times P2 has to um, be higher than the bound given, was before it was just P1, say. So in this case, even though you get individual bounds, adding more states may drop the Schmidt number depending on where you fall in this regime. Not necessarily if your state is good enough and high enough in your kind of uh, Schmidt number, but if it gets worse and worse, then adding more states will at some point lower your Schmidt number inevitably. Is this kind of clear? Good. And so we also compared this to different semi-device independent regimes. Um, so this has just repeated the bound from the previous slide. Um, then there has been a paper on high dimensional steering. So just the standard bipartite case. Uh, and they also found a bound for this state, which is actually higher. So they require less noise than what we would need for the same Schmidt number. And you can also find a bound um, if you want to use the simulability of measurements and then apply the equivalence between uh, simulability of a measurement and high dimensional steering. And so if you have one or two states in your network, we've performed better. But if you would have hundreds of states, at some point, our bounds would be worse because the bound stays the same whilst we just add products of this. So if you want to test, say, just one state, but you only have access to this state, but a really good entangled state on the other side, then it's worth implementing this protocol. So yeah, so I hope this Schmidt number things are clear, um, in which case I would like to move on to this activation of high dimensional one-way steerable states. Okay, so just to clarify in case people haven't heard of it, what is one-way steering? So one-way steering means that, for example, Bob cannot steer Alice. So if Alice is trusted, Bob is untrusted, no matter the choice of measurement on Bob's side, 
And even if Alice does full state tomography, there's always a local hidden state model that can be found that explains the assemblage that Alice has at the end. But if Alice chooses her measurements wisely and Bob is the trusted party, she can actually demonstrate steering to Bob. Um, to make clear which direction is steerable and which one isn't, I'll be having this like arrow between the parties just to make sure we know which direction our state is. Um, and then recently there was a paper bringing this to high dimensionality. And so the idea is that maybe Bob can't steer Alice at all, but Alice can steer Bob in a high dimensional way, meaning that we can actually certify a Schmidt number greater than two, maybe 10, maybe whatever you choose, but like some higher number, not just whether it is entangled or not. And so in this uh, paper, they gave some example state, well, really a set of example states, and so this state is essentially the state we looked at before. So the maximum entangled state and some white noise. And now we also have some lost channel and the channel is applied to Bob's side. So we have this extra term with uh, one minus eta uh, where there's an identity applied on Alice. Well, a normalized identity applied to Alice and a lost channel applied to Bob's side. And in this paper, they find that if the uh, amount of noise is smaller than this given bound, then, uh, sorry, greater than this given bound, then we have um, some unsteerability from Bob to Alice. But if the loss is not too big, then we can actually see that uh, Alice can still steer Bob in a D-dimensional way, meaning that we can actually certify Schmidt number D in this case. Uh, excuse me, what is the action of this lost channel? Does it reduce dimensionality or? Um, so it just brings, so the assumption is that, um, so this Psi plus um, operates in some D dimensional space and then the loss kind of um, projects it onto a different space. So oh, in this case, actually Bob's side is um, D plus one dimensional. Oh, I see, yeah, thanks. Great, any other questions? Okay, and so we wanted to see if we can use this state that is one way steerable in this like bipartite case and apply it to a network and see if we can now steer. If we now have Bob having access to two of these copies and having the end that cannot steer to the other parties in both cases, can he actually still steer to Alice and Charlie in a like Schmidt number N way? And so, okay, you take the state, and again, you can write it out as um, a partial trace. And for example, if Bob performs a, something Bell-like measurement so that he, for example, projects onto the um, Psi plus state, you can actually see that he can get a bound where the product of the two um, uh, Ps, so the amount of um, Psi plus you have compared to white noise, as long as it still satisfies this analytical bound that we found for the, the uh, device dependent case, and which we also saw in our um, measurement case before when we looked at the example, if we still satisfy this, then Bob can actually perform steering, which is certifiably to some Schmidt number N. So here, if you wanted to compare the two bounds to the one before uh, and wanted to look at D dimensional steering, then you would equate n to d and you can see that we actually do better in this case so there are indeed states where you cannot steer from bob to alice but if you put it in the network in this way uh, bob can steer alice and charlie and we can certify this and so you could also bring this to a bigger network if you wish to um, and then depending on how many states you add you would um, well recover this kind of bound with the um, product again, which is reminiscent of what we saw for the best separable approximation, since it's a similar idea here again. Um, and then you can still certify the Schmidt number n, and then um, as long as you don't add too many states, you would still be able to find states that are only one way steerable, but can be used in this like activation way in the network to demonstrate steering. Any questions about this part?
Okay, great. So I hope I could convince you that we can use this kind of network steering to certify entanglement in a qualitative way, and that we can use it to activate high dimensional one way steerable states and networks. And so the quantifiers we looked at in this presentation were the best separable approximation and the Schmidt number. But we can also go further and look at other quantifiers, such as the Schmidt measure, which is a different general generalization of the Schmidt rank. Um, other robustnesses, we can look at negativity and these types of things, but we can also ask ourselves what can we certify about the measurements, so the untrusted measurements on Bob's side, can we say anything about these, and so you can actually certify the um, Hilbert space dimension, or at least lower bound, um, the Hilbert space dimension that these are operating on, and you can certify some form of Schmidt number but adapted for operators. Now, if you wish to add inputs, then we can have some more interesting properties about the measurements that we can certify, namely the incompatibility of measurements um, and the simulability of measurements. Uh, this is obviously only possible if you have inputs, as these are properties that one measurement never uh, satisfies, since one measurement is always jointly measurable and has simulability of one. In the future, it would be nice to generalize this kind of framework to multipartite sources and other network structures um, so that we can ask ourselves what can we certify here in a semi device independent way by maybe trusting one or two parties or maybe even more, depending on how our network looks then. So thank you very much for listening and coming to the talk. Thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you for your, your talk. Now we can open. To, to more questions of the audience. Okay, so perhaps I'll have a question. So uh, so in the last slide, you, you said that you are going to uh, also check what happens with negativity and so on. So is it, I mean, what's the intuition? I mean, is it, uh, uh, do you think it's still possible to, to get this type of inequalities for like every environment measure? Uh, so this would be our hope, is that you can find something inequality wise, because the important part is usually if it's something that cannot be changed by a measurement mm -hmm. uh, on Bob, then it should usually propagate through the network. And this is kind of the idea here, that as long as we choose a property that um, does not change, if, if we just operate on one side, then the hope would be that it propagates through. Mm -hmm. And so, so so how, how do you prove uh, this, this type of inequalities, for instance, for the I know what is Schmidt measure because um, they, they're really simple and uh... yes so essentially when you have the network so um let's see why is it here if you have this network you mm -hmm. can write the final state in terms of a um partial trace over mm -hmm. bob's so... two systems and then it's essentially just writing so for the schmidt measure for example you would write it in the uh, Schmidt de well, you would write it in a decomposition into pure states, you would write it into uh, Schmidt decomposition, and then go th like sort through the terms and then reorganize such that ideally you would have something where you can kind of see the separation between Alice and Charlie to mm -hmm. some extent, and then you can kind of find a structure that looks mm -hmm. like a Schmidt measure, but then up to normalization, obviously. And so mm -hmm. you can use that. Um, and I mean, the reason why it's always a lower bound is that we don't assume anything about the measurement, right? So you would mm -hmm. have a general measurement in there um, and you would just say, okay, no matter what the measurement does, because I can separate out everything else, then this has to follow. This is kind of the idea. Okay, thank you. Hey, do we have more questions? Well, I have more, but maybe the other people. <laughs> if you just turn on the camera, maybe he will submit a question. No, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, maybe I, but uh, that's not like it's kind of related to what I asked before, because based on your answer, I would guess that you could also do the same, like kind of I apply the same idea to networks that have like a tree structure in a sense where you put trusted parties in the nodes which have more than two connections. Is it correct or? Would you have to like? Um, so I guess as long as you can break off the network yeah, yeah, precisely, lines, precisely. then it, yes, then it should be fine. And you could think of them as separate lines 
maybe there's something beyond that that you could do if by doing this joint mm. measurements that would obviously then be something that we would have to investigate but as long as you can break it up this should be possible mm. um however if you have measurements on more than two qubits and you don't trust them so you can't like break them apart mm -hmm. uh then the problem becomes that things like schmidt number are not well defined for your post measurement state oh, anymore yeah. um so as long as you kind of obey these two rules of only bipartite sources only untrusted measurements on uh two qubits at a time then this should be fine and you should be able to break them apart okay thank you okay so maybe i'll ask my question so um, so do you think it's possible? So here, Alice and Charlie are trusted, and so you can perform uh, like a full tomography on their particles, okay? Mm -hmm. Their particles. So do you think it's possible, like, once you have the density matrices, is it possible to completely characterize Bob's measurements at the, the state row one and row two? It's like a kind of self testing statement. Yes. Um, I would suspect that you run into issues given that you only have one measurement on Bob's side. Um, and that you hence, for example, can't differentiate row one and row two completely in some sense, because you can't really find individual bounds on row one and row two if we don't have measurement inputs to Bob's side, as far as I'm aware. And so I I would, I would suspect that you've run into issues here, but I'm mm -hmm. not 100% certain. Okay, and have you thought of like a, a relaxed scenario in which one of the parties say Alice is uh, untrusted? Because here um, both, both are trusted, no? so in principle we can still relax this yes. scenario to one in which only one part is uh, trusted. Yes, so then uh, say we distrust Charlie, mm -hmm. then between Alice and Bob it looks like a steering thing and it looks like Charlie is just kind of giving an input to Bob. So. I would think that you can still do everything up to steerability on row one, but row two, I would guess, is less easy to, well, you, mm -hmm. you end up with something more similar to a bell test, I guess. Yeah, um, okay. So I think if you break it up into like steering and kind of non-locality scenarios, I would suspect that you can still do something. Um, but yeah, I mean, what you can do, which is not exactly lifting the trust, but you could, instead of doing full state tomography, you could do things like just witnesses. So for example, these bounds, uh, you can also, with the correct measurements on Bob's side and this type of state and these things, you can recover the bounds by just applying witnesses um, or entangle, uh, Schmidt number witness uh, on the state shared between Alice and Charlie. And so you don't need to do full state tomography. So this would be a possibility. In this case, you're obviously still trusting them, but you don't have to do the full state tomography. Well, I guess you can just apply some steering inequalities. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. Thanks for the question. So, Sophie, would you expect any asymptotic behavior if you have a, a big number of bobs between Alice and Charlie? I mean, I guess depending on what you assume about the states. Like, I would assume that if we say they're imperfect, so for example, here, if P is not equal to 1, I would think that the more parties you add, you would always end up with something separable because your noise would at some point, you know, get too large. Um, so this is what I would expect, but then this is assuming that the states are not perfect. If you have perfect states, then I don't think anything would change. Well, if your states and your measurements are perfect, I wouldn't expect anything to change by adding more parties. Um, but if you assume that they are noisy, I would expect to get to something separable if you just add enough measurements in enough states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, if we don't have more questions, I think we can finish unless anybody raised their hand. No? So uh, thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, maybe we can open the microphones and, and clap our hands to, to Sophie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you all for coming and bye. Bye. See you, Sophie. Bye bye. bye.